Hello everyone. Today I'm here to talk about my path to discover permaculture, my journey to write recipes for reciprocity, the regenerative way from seed to table, and my path to regenerate from the inside out. Planting a garden invited me to develop a more intimate relationship with the plants and fungi that nourish my body. Permaculture design helped me to take that relationship a step further to nurture a reciprocal relationship with those organisms. Through that process, I developed pattern recognition and problem solving skills that now assist me in areas of my life outside the garden. Taking the advanced permaculture student online helped me take those pattern recognition lenses, reciprocal relationships, and connections with humans, plants, fungi, and other beings to a whole nother level. Being able to engage with a community of hundreds of inquisitive, intelligent, nature-loving individuals who are living in such a varying array of geographic, cultural, hydrological, geological, economic, and spiritual backgrounds allowed me to reflect on a wide range of perspectives. Along that path, Matt Powers, the other course instructors, instructional video contributors, and my classmates have offered invaluable feedback, reciprocal idea sharing sessions, network support, and constructive criticism which was instrumental in giving me the confidence to put my first written work out into the world. I highly suggest APSO to anyone who is interested in growing their own nutrient-dense food in a way that gives back to the land and respects the earth, creating or optimizing a business that is regenerative, or just for anyone who wants to understand the natural world with more clarity. Being able to have access to and consider so many different approaches for turning problems into solutions in APSO has been a powerful asset as I sought to expand and hone my own understanding and eventually to take on my advanced permaculture design project of writing and self-publishing my own book. So now I'll read the introduction from my book, Recipes for Reciprocity, The Regenerative Way from Seed to Table, so you can get an idea of how I synthesized all those experiences and pathways of learning into a single project. In the following pages, you will find recipes for much more than just creating food. You will find recipes for nourishing soil, relationships with each other and the earth, ways to nourish community and increase our collective resilience as we head towards what appears to be an uncertain future. I will also provide recipes for regenerating our hope, recipes for re rekindling a sense of purpose, recipes for reciprocating the many blessings we receive and continue to receive, and recipes for food for the soul. Each moment is an unrepeatable gift. Each breath, an unfathomable miracle of celestial mathematics, molecular biophysics, and a symphony of intricate symbiotic relationships. It took eons of tireless work to set the stage for you to live here now in this life. Mother Earth has nurtured and built a paradise and a sanctuary for you to experience, co-create in, and share. This book is a roadmap to reconnect with Mother Earth through gardening, creating and reciprocating the gifts she shares with us in her own unique way. Since the, since the moment we are born, we are showered with gifts that we have not earned in any way. Air to breathe, sunlight to warm our face, water to quench our thirst and inspire our senses love and companionship from our fellow beings, human and non-human, and food to nourish our bodies and imaginations, food which invariably originated from the earth. We are given these countless blessings from the universe, Mother Earth, and our fellow beings without anything being asked of us in return. As we spend more time on this planet, we begin to see how our modern human civilization is structured in a way in which it takes from the living earth and gives nothing back. This leaves us feeling an emptiness inside, and a pain in our hearts, for the truth is that everything is connected, biologically, electromagnetically, and on a quantum level, and we or our fellow beings hurt the earth by taking and giving nothing back, we hurt ourselves. This book is about taking decisive action to give back to our mother earth, through caring for her soils, and lessening the pressure of our large demanding industries on our ecosystems, through withdrawing our support from those systems, through growing some of our own food. This book is about returning the gift, giving back to the living planet 
and to our fellow beings, human and non-human. When we use our free will to co-create abundance through aligning with the creative forces of nature, we are offered more than just nourishment for the body, we are offered medicine for the soul. Caring for our bodies through creating delicious and nutritious meals is also returning the gift. For it means we are honoring and expressing gratitude for the blessing we have been given, these amazing bodies that allow us to go about life on earth. We are honoring all the kindness, the care, and the generosity that was gifted to us by our fellow beings, that nurtured us when we are unable to nurture ourselves. When we take good care of our bodies, express compassion, and share our abundance, living life to the fullest, we are honoring the gifts that Mother Earth and our fellow beings gave us so we could be who and what we are today. This book is also about a celebration of culinary creativity, community building, and giving back through delicious foods. In this book, you will find an invitation to, to cultivate a deep appreciation for how precious and valuable the infinite diversity of both individuals and cultures are on the planet Earth. From these pages emerges an outstretched hand, intended to guide the reader down a path to cherish cultural diversity for all the exquisite culinary, horticultural, and philo philosophical gifts they offer, while also simultaneously acknowledging and living from the understanding of the innate truth that we are all part of one family. In the pages that follow, I will provide you with a passport for your senses, allowing you to adventure into experiencing cultures of faraway lands and discover poetry for the senses, as well as ecologically grounded wisdom that these rich and illustrious cultures offer the world. In choosing to work with our hands to nurture the soil and learn to grow our own food, using our harvest to create and honor diverse cultures, we nourish the body and the soul and we plant the seeds for not only ourselves, but also for future generations, offering both ourselves and them an abundance of true wealth. True wealth, as I define it, refers to the degree of which one is self-sustaining, self living sustainably, or better yet, living regeneratively, and the degree of which one has established a lasting symbiotic relationship with the land one lives on, and those beings that one shares the land with. Beyond those physical defining parameters, it is also defined by the measure of which one feels happy and at peace inwardly, truly elusive states of being for many on earth, poor and rich alike. Unlike material wealth, which is temporary and cannot provide lasting happiness, true wealth is permanent and nurtures lasting happiness. It is more about the measure of how much one gives, shares and connects, and less about what one takes, acquires or hordes. The true gift of wealth The gift of true wealth is found in the years, lasting fulfillment and health which is added to our lives when we care for the land we live on and those we share it with. Lasting fulfillment is found in savoring those precious moments that we are given each time we stop to appreciate the little things, to remember our innate curiosity feeling a sense of awe as we bear witness to the miracle of life all around us and within us. This is the gift we give ourselves when we choose to use our time on earth to help things to grow and nurture them onto their highest potential. While I have learned much from the wise, intelligent, compassionate, and innovative humans in the permaculture community, the greatest gift that human teachers have given me is helping to widen my lenses of perception and pattern recognition aptitude so I would be ready to learn from an even more advanced, ancient, wise, and learned teacher. She is, she is the teacher that speaks to us in the language of fractal geometry and the symbiotic relationships she weaves into her genius life support systems. She is the living earth. This has allowed me to see that nature has the potential to be a far greater teacher than any human ever could be. This is why when people ask me what I do, I will often say that I am currently enrolled in a lifetime apprenticeship to the earth. Once I began to pay attention to all the dynamics at play within a functioning ecosystem with my eyes and heart wide open, this empowered me to be able to design my garden in a way that required less physical labor, less irrigation, 
no synthetic fertilizer, and yet more productive in crop yield and crop quality. After I, After I began to weave reciprocal facets that exist in nature into my garden, I began to see native pollinators, diverse soil organisms, many winged visitors, and others arrive and make a home for themselves. Seeing that ecosystem thrive each day when I am out working in the garden, while also being able to grow food and medicine, gives me hope for the future and motiv motivates me to get up each day and give my time and energy to enriching, diversifying, and nurturing that ecosystem. I do this so that it can serve as both an heirloom seed and native pollinator sanctuary, as well as a classroom where I can learn from observing all the organisms that exist there. Beyond the scope of this small little patch of earth that we tend as stewards, I find great hope, joy, inspiration, and motivation through studying and learning about ancient food forests, or forest gardens, which have stood the test of time and are still providing habitat, cleaning the air, sequestering CO2, creating food, medicine, soil stabilization, and water cycle stabilization despite in many cases no longer being tended by their indigenous co-creators. What motivates me to take positive action is seeing how many are looking to the ancient wisdom of the living earth and the peoples who lived in relative equilibrium with her, life support systems, for centuries and millennia to design resilient, regenerative, and symbiotic systems to grow food and organize our communities going forward. We have great we have great people like Michael Whitman of Blue Sky Biochar, who is learning from and educating, educating people about the regenerative roles of fire in natural ecosystems, and systems that are managed by ancient indigenous peoples, like how the peoples of South America created the fa famous Terra Preta of the Amazon. And we have the courageous and intelligent trailblazers like Dr. Lila June, who is helping uncover and revitalize forgotten ancient regenerative agroforestry food forest design methods of the original inhabitants of Turtle Island through her groundbreaking dissertation titled The Architects of Abundance. These living examples of how humans can design ways to produce food and medicine which align with, integrate with, nurture, and help to regenerate mature forest ecosystems offers us a bridge to directly engage with the wisdom gathered by our ancestors and invites us to build similar bridges that will connect to future generations, allowing our actions today to not only feed ourselves, but to provide fellow non-human beings on this earth with a sanctuary in the here and now, and then also offering a loving hand extended to our descendants, offering them access to the fruits of our labor. I am motivated to take positive action when I look at this world through nature's eyes, perceiving the inherent abundance and regenerative capacity of the earth, and then going out and playing an active role in propagating that abundance, lending my energy to accelerate that regeneration and helping others to do the same, while guiding my actions by the permaculture ethical compass of earth care, people care, and future care. I feel that it's important that we also acknowledge the challenges that we will face when walking such a path. When one truly makes the res resolute decision to live by an ethical compass that prioritizes not only compassion and caring for humans, but also caring for and preserving the integrity of the earth, her wilderness places, her ecosystems, while also making sure each action is chosen with the conscious awareness of how it will impact and benefit future generations in a time when our dominant societal norms place a priority on profit before kindness and generosity, quick fix easy high-tech solutions over hard work and getting one's hands dirty, material comforts and convenient complacency over compassion, and conformity for the sake of fitting in over choosing moral courage, one will inevitably be confronted by significant friction and hurdles. While there may be those individuals and institutions that would seek to impede or halt your efforts. These hurdles and challenges you face offer opportunities for personal growth, developing social permaculture skills, and using the frictions such situations provide to sharpen the blade of your mind so that you can be a more and more effective agent of regeneration, earth care, 
people care, and future care. It is like how diamonds can only form under great pressure, and how when an heirloom open pollinated plant in your garden receives the challenging stimulus of cold, wind, or drought, these hurdles offer that being a chance to rise to the occasion, adapting and becoming more capable and resilient of thriving in the long term, passing that valuable experience on to future generations. I will now offer a few examples of how striving to live by the ethical imperatives of earth care, people care, and future care have invited rewarding challenges onto my path that offered me an opportunity to grow, to rise above the temptation to conform, and to regenerate inwardly. During the past three years, there were several instances where corporations and their various friends and involuntary governance structures enforced irrational, degenerative, and uns unscientific edicts onto the general population here in Canada. As I observed these various totalitarian mandates and coercion tactics being rolled out, I saw that farmers markets, local mom and pop businesses were being shut down, while large transnational corporate businesses providing the same variety of products such as Walmart and Costco were allowed to stay open and monopolize the customers. This move crippled small businesses and funneled the profits to corporations under the guise of public safety measures. In conjunction with various coercive mandates, which also served to funnel profits to other transnational corporations that violated Canada's Charter of Rights for Bodily Autonomy, as well as the Nuremberg Code. This compelled me to put my social permaculture and people care hat on, to shine a light on these various degenerative, institutionalized forms of discrimination and predatory corporate behavior. Due to widespread fear and what Charles Eisenstein described as mob mentality, my choice to speak out on these two things, in alignment with the permaculture ethical compass, resulted in some people turning their back on me and some doors closing in my life. Well, that was emotionally challenging. It also resulted in new doors opening in my local community. I was, invited I was invited to speak about the importance and power of seed saving for increasing community food security at a community meeting where business owners, farmers, and everyday people were being impacted by the above described government mandates and they had come together to find support and help each other through challenging times. This resulted in several local business owners who were in the attendance approaching me and offering to have my book for sale at their place of business. Beyond the opening of doors and opportunities to sell my book locally, I also met people interested in commu creating community gardens and food forests. So while my choice to make the hard decision to live by my ethical compass and engage in people care by speaking out resulted in some doors closing and relationships ending, it also opened others and planted the seeds for new ones to bloom. In essence, the choice to not merely talk or write about an ethical compass, but to actually put it into my life in action, even when it was not popular to do so, offered me the opportunity to apply regenerative concepts from the inside out. This began with refusing to go along when bullying, gaslighting, and aggressive corporate monopolizing became an institutionalized norm which provoked a reaction from those who had capitulated and internalized those norms. Those reactions from others around me in my life became a catalyst, illuminating the true nature of many people, offering me a chance to identify and stop feeding into toxic and stagnant relationships, and instead redirect my energy to more fertile areas of my life and new relationships that involved reciprocity, humility, and integrity. Beyond just looking at these things through the lens of the permaculture ethical compass, I also, came to, I also came to realize that beneath all the conditioning, before we are trained to behave and see things otherwise, embodying a way that involves earth care, people care, and future care is the most natural state of being for all humans. For it is a way and a perspective that aligns with the innate essence of the perspective of our eternal spirit. In this way, the choice to live by the permaculture ethical compass offered me the chance to regenerate my own innate integrity, courage, and the ecosystems of relationships in my life, while helping offer signposts to find my soul tribe. I will now share a quote from a Charles Eisenstein essay titled, A Path Will Rise to Meet Us, that I feel aptly speaks to how when we choose to follow our heart with compassion and truth as our guide, Regardless of what pressures we are dealing with externally, synchronistic connections are aligned with our path 
to help us along our journey to heal and illuminate the facts as we strive to work towards a regenerative future. An abuser, whether a person or a system, offers up an opportunity to graduate to a new degree of sovereignty. We claim by example what a human being is. When made at risk, such a claim issues forth as a prayer. An intelligence beyond rational understanding responds to that prayer and reorganizes the world around it. We may experience this as synchronicity, which seems to happen with uncanny frequency, just as those moments where one takes a leap in the dark. She leaves the abusive spouse in the dead of night with nowhere to get go. Yet she is not reckless because she knows it's time. She steps out into nothingness and lo and behold, something meets her foot. A path invisible from the starting point opens with each step along it. So shall it be. The world will rearrange itself around the brave choices of millions of people as we are choosing the knowledge it is time. Another example where striving to live by the permaculture ethical compass invited me to embark upon a path of personal growth, introspection, and learning was when I read a book called Bright Green Lives and began to educate myself about many of the so-called sustainable energy alternatives to petroleum. Learning about the ecologically destructive impact of lithium mining and the ecologically devastating as well as human dignity degrading impacts of cobalt mining invited me to take an honest look at my own priorities and see the ethical imperative of earth care with newfound clarity and purpose. As I began to learn more about the current lithium mining operations in Bolivia and the large-scale open pit lithium mines planned for northern Ontario, planned to be cut into the earth and bedrock underneath what is now pristine boreal forest, I came to realize that, given the current types of battery technology they depend on to function, e-vehicles are not really the sustainable green alternative to petroleum-powered vehicles that I had once thought they were. In light of this new understanding, I sought to bring awareness to the reality of the aspects of the UN's so-called Sustainable Development Agenda that currently hinges on lithium battery tech, which is not only environmentally degenerative, it is also unsustainable in the long run. This resulted in a great deal of friction from proponents of electric vehicles and the various other technologies that use lithium and cobalt, and again, resulted in some doors and some relationships closing in my life. This was again not easy emotionally, but it offered me another opportunity to see what people's true priorities were in my immediate circles, which did not necessarily align with wilderness conservation and ecologically centered words that they describe themselves with. What I discovered through my path to take a long and hard look at whether or not lithium and cobalt based battery tech was aligned with the permaculture ethical compass and my own innate moral code is that there was part of me that actually wanted to find a way to justify lithium and cobalt mining in the interest of continuing to have access to the technological comforts and addictions I had become accustomed to in my life. There was part of me that sought to place a priority on ease and comfort over honoring the earth and protecting her last few remaining intact wilderness places. This drive to put perpetuating our technologically dependent and addicted modern way of life as a priority over protecting the integrity of wilderness places has a name. It is called bright green environmentalism. Bright green environmentalism, which is not really about protecting or preserving nature at all, but rather about preserving our modern wasteful way of life, often involves another movement of the government and corporate assets, which I call green colonialism. It involves an elaborate system of armies of lawyers, lobbyists, bribes, and sometimes using police as corporate mercenaries in order to continue the same trend of dispossession and theft of land from indigenous people that many now think of as ancient history. In places such as Thatcher Pass in the United States and here in Northern Ontario, Lithium corporations are moving in, with the help of government, to invade and pillage the unceded territories of indigenous peoples, without their permission, in order to rip apart the bones of the earth, for profit. These are anthropocentric perspectives that place human comfort, profit margins, and technological addictions as the priority, and the integrity of the biosphere and wilderness second. 
They're coming, to They're coming to see how that way of thinking has permeated into many institutions, and taking a long, honest look in the mirror, I was able to come to see that it was not a path that aligns with respecting and honoring Mother Earth, nor the permaculture ethical compass, nor my own innate moral compass. I'm still working on figuring out what that will mean for my future in interacting with technology that depends on said material extraction operations. But for now, I've decided to stop buying anything newly manufactured that uses lithium and cobalt battery tech. I also started to write a series of essays on my blog on Substack intended to help raise awareness on the impacts of large-scale lithium mining operations and how they will impact the boreal forest, the hydrological cycle, and the biosphere as a whole. This has motivated me to look at new and old strategies for planning our homestead, such as hydrogen solar systems and scaling back our dependency on gadgets for a more back-to-basic way of living. That is another pathway that the permaculture ethical compass has helped me to embark on a path inward that involves regenerating from the inside out. That path of inward exploration and outward activism has also helped me connect with amazing human beings who are working to regenerate and protect the boreal forests and other areas that are being targeted by mining corporations and government sustainable development initiatives. Thus, is it, all, it is also a pathway that helps me to connect with my soul tribe, allowing us to join forces and work towards a more regenerative future. In closing, I would like to read a few excerpts from my recently published book that speaks to the subject matter I have addressed in this talk. The first excerpt I'll read is from the chapter titled Regenerating Communities and Nurturing the Gift Economy. In a conversation between Charles Eisenstein and Brock Dolman, they were talking about regenerating ecosystems and how first we actually need to in engage in the process of regenerating our inner ecosystem. Brock Dolman described this by saying we need to plant the seeds for ecosystem restoration. I really resonate with this idea, and so this played a foundation in what I was going to write about in my book. Here's another excerpt from the same chapter. I feel that in order to begin building a lasting framework for a regenerative economy that aligns with keeping the gift in motion, we must first redefine what it means to be a human being. In order to break from an old paradigm and shape a new one, we must stop seeking outside of ourselves and look inward. As each of us become reacquainted with the part of ourselves that existed before we came into these bodies, and will continue to exist long after, we move into an awareness that involves self-awareness and intuitive discernment. This is the realization and state of being that when embraced by enough people, can be a catalyst for rendering the current system on earth obsolete and planting the seeds for a future of peace, abundance, and equality for all mankind. I believe this is the single most important thing that we can give our children. If we guide them to look inward as they grow up, they will serve as the spiritual antidote for this world which is currently infected by a rampant ego disease of the mind. Furthermore, as we use our time to nurture the inner garden, teaching the young ones to do the same, and from that irrepressible place of clarity, confidence, and purpose, direct our energy to invest in the earth, we, th we would draw our support from corrupt and oppressive centralized human systems. In doing so, we begin to render them obsolete so we can one day leave them behind. As we begin to reimagine our definition of wealth and see our own well-being and wealth as intrinsically tied to the health and wealth of the ecosystems that support us, we move towards a more equitable and abundant future for all who will call this place home after we are gone. As we strive to redefine what it means to be a human being, I invite you to also examine the stagnant and calcified perception we have of concepts like courage, wisdom, and strength. Courage and wisdom take many forms. One of the most potent forms they take is expressed in the choice to become and live the authentic embodiment of that which you wish to see in the world around you. This means moving beyond just talking about a vision for a new paradigm on earth and truly knowing this paradigm and age is as real as the baby that has not yet emerged from the mother when she goes into labor. It means having the same faith and knowing you embody when you sow those seeds in the rich soil, water, and expect them to sprout and becoming something beautiful. When I say faith, I do not mean passively wishing for something to be true. 
I mean knowing something in your heart and making it a reality through concrete actions. Do not wish for a better world. Become the essence of that better world in your every thought, perspective, relationship, and action. In light of these different ways of perceiving courage and wisdom, I now invite you to redefine what you perceive as strength. As I see it, real strength is acting upon that which arises from the heart, with the guiding compass of putting our gifts into the service for the betterment of all beings. It is a lot more challenging to let our ego take the back seat and choose a path in service to our fellow beings than it is to train and use our muscles to exert force and achieve some ego-flattering display of physical prowess. Thus, true strength is determined not by our ability to exert force, but rather by the degree of which we summon the courage to allow our spirit to take the driver's seat, and the degree of which we see and act from the heart. When we embody that kind of strength, it allows us to tap into a deep well of spiritual wealth that exists within each of us. From that place, we are capable of expanding our ideas of what forms gift can, gifts can take in our efforts to regenerate our communities and nurture a gift-based economy. Gifts can come in a great many forms. Choosing to be present and give our attention to our fellow beings and the living earth is a gift any of us can give. Choosing to listen, hold love in our hearts, and to see the latent potential in our fellow humans no matter how unpleasant their current behavior patterns may be, is a gift we can also give. These are the gifts that show our gratitude, reverence, and recognition for the sacredness of all life. These are gifts that leave space for others to grow, and gifts that invite their higher self to take the driver's seat and help us to co-create a more beautiful world alongside of us. Some of the most beautiful gifts that embody the spirit of hope, kindness, joy, and goodwill are those gifts you arrived with when you chose to come to this world and live a human life you are living now. These gifts are inside you. They are unique to you, and you possess them so that you can engage in the sacred task of sharing those gifts with the world. When you take time to look inward, discover your unique gifts, and imagine a way you can use them to nurture other beings, helping them to achieve their highest potential giving back to the living planet that gives so much to us, and creating things that express the essence of your spirit manifested in physical form and poetry for the senses. You are giving the most valuable gift in the universe. No one else can share these same gifts exactly as you have the potential to do. You are the sowers of the seeds of change. You are the remediators of humanity's collective consciousness. You are the gardeners that sow the seeds of hope, healing, remembrance, kindness, respect, solidarity, and compassion, even in the midst of the cold winter winds, having faith that these seeds will germinate and take root, and the roots will spread when the time is right. You are not alone. Our tribe came here in great numbers at this time. Go forth now and find the others. It is time to embody the template for that which will be and cut our ties to that which was. You're in the right place. The last excerpt I'll read from my book is from the, the chapter titled Regenerative Poems, Short Stories, and Recipes for Food for the Soul. When you learn to understand what nature is communicating to us, you are invited to read a scripture that is far older than all man-made religious texts. In this ancient gospel, as old as the mountains and as ancient as the seas, wisdom is inscribed which teaches us to live in peace, abundance, symbiosis, and harmony with our fellow beings. Through opening our eyes to the symbiosis present on all levels of nature, we are invited to become one with a resilient and learned community of life. When we pay attention to these interwoven facets of nature, which have coexisted in perfect balance on earth for countless millennia, we are then able to emulate and embody these living systems and apply their tested and proven wisdom to our relationships, our lives, and our societies on earth. Through learning from those ancient living libraries of knowledge that were created through eons of trial and error while nature experimented with what works and what does not, 
we can let go of our unsustainable path and choose a new direction as a species. With the ancient symbiotic relationships in nature as our teachers, we can begin to release the arrogant and backwards path that we have been on and embrace a new path which can lead humanity into a new paradigm and a new civilization on earth which is reverent, equitable, regenerative, and prosperous. I discovered this ancient scripture when I learned to read the soil, watch the sky, and help the things in between to grow and thrive. For me, the seasons are sacred. They are chapters in a story with much wisdom to share. In the springtime, I am reminded how even after the darkest and coldest nights, the light will shine again, and new life will unfold if we nourish it. In the summer, I am in awe of the infinite diversity and resilience of all the life forms in creation. I walk in cathedrals with mossy floors, proud tile walls of trees, with arms outstretched that paint the blue stained glass roof speckled in green. In the autumn, I learn about acceptance, releasing what no longer serves me, and giving my time and energy so that future generations can enjoy the same blessings I have. In the winter, I learn about trust, faith, courage, and seeing beautiful moments in that which most would consider less than. The seasons speak to us of ancient agreements between the elemental kingdoms and lessons learned through eons. Each time you cradle a handful of rich soil in your hands, you are holding our most precious inheritance. In your hands is the story of a thousand bountiful seasons and the hope of a thousand that have yet to be. When you work with the earth and nourish things to grow and achieve their highest potential, you are showing reverence for the sacred gift we have been given, a sanctuary, a home that provides all we need to live in peace, happiness, and prosperity. Thanks so much for listening to my talk and going with me on the journey to write my book and learn about permaculture. For those that are interested in getting a copy of my book, I'm going to create a discount code that's unique to the Our Future Conference. So if you go on my website or if you get an ebook through the PayHip link below, you'll be able to access a 25% discount on the ebook by using the discount code OURFUTURE, it's lowercase, no spaces. The same on my website to get $10 off of a physical copy of my book. Thanks so much for putting this amazing conference together, Matt. Thank you to all my fellow APSA students that helped me along the way to write this book. And thank you to all of you who are watching out there. Thank you for caring about our Mother Earth. Together, we can make a regenerative future.